Uh, and I think we're out of time to get through all of item 23, but I am going to do this. I'm going to open it. Um, Tyler, I just want to get uh, a little bit of feedback in terms of what came back from LCB on the rewrite so that everyone's clear because I think in some of the comments that I saw coming back, um, maybe it wasn't completely clear what the changed uh, language and regulation said. And then if someone's here with a burning desire to address um, electronic rifle triggers, calibers, or cartridge length, they can do that. It is not my intent, and I will not accept any motions uh, on the regulation today, but I want to give everyone a few minutes, since we do have a little bit of time, to at least clarify uh, some of the confusion that I think is going on, and then if we have comments, we'll take those. Okay? Fair enough? So we'll open item number 23, Commission General Regulation 458, electronic rifle triggers, caliber, and cartridge length and smokeless powder restrictions, LCB file number R144-15, Chief Game Warden Tyler Turnipseed, for possible action. And that's all I'm going to provide. Um, Tyler, I think uh, in terms of the uh, smokeless powder portion, there were no changes. I do believe there were changes on the electronic rifle triggers as well as the caliber and cartridge length. And if you could just step us through the changes to those language uh, pieces. For clarification, we'll be ready to go in August. You bet, Chairman Drew, members of the Commission, Chief Game Warden Tyler, turn up seat again. Um, so you do want me to just go through the regulation uh, sort of piece by piece and explain what each person does? Or uh, do you want me to get into a little bit of the public correspondence or just look at the language? Um, I would probably just focus on the language on pages three and four. Okay. Um, so what we're talking about in caliber and cartridge length, um, was uh, started out sort of as an effort to look at 50 BMG rifles and if whether or not they have a place in hunting or not. Um, sort of a fair chase uh, thought on uh, protecting our hunting heritage when it comes to um, you know drawing a line of how big is too big. <clears throat> so I can get to that part in just a second, the, the part on page four. But first, so that we're in order of the of the regulation, on page three there were some changes that the board moved to uh, suggest at the uh, the last meeting that we heard this in workshop form. And uh, that actually deals with the minimum caliber and cartridge size that can be used on a big game animal. So if you look at your regulation there on page four, uh, subsection four, it uh, used to say a person may hunt big game mammals with a rifle if the rifle uses a center fire cartridge of caliber 22 or larger. And then it went on to describe uh, handgun calibers. So. LCB lined out that portion of rifle if the rifle uses a center fired car cartridge of caliber 22 or larger because it addressed it on the next page in terms of caliber. One thing that, uh, that I did chat with um, Chairman Drew about briefly was that there may have been an unintended uh, result of that in striking out center fire cartridge because then if you fast forward to the section on the next page, um, section 5B talks about a rifle if the rifle uses a center fire cartridge that is smaller than 22 or larger than caliber 50. Um, it, it addresses center fire for a rifle, but then when we started talking about the uh, handguns, um, well, let's see, I lost myself here. I think the issue is that on handguns, the center fire portion stayed in but there is no prohibition on a basically a rimfire rifle now. Exactly. So in striking out the language in Section 4, rifle if the rifle uses a center fire cartridge, um, the center fire part came, comes out because Section 5B says it is unlawful to hunt a big game mammal with a rifle if the rifle uses a center fire cartridge that is smaller than caliber 22 or larger than caliber 50. What that does is it used to say that you can that you can hunt big game mammals with a rifle as long as it's center fire. Then the language changed a little bit, a little bit of a nuance in the language is that five now says it's unlawful to hunt a big game mammal with, and then it describes what it's unlawful to hunt with. So practically speaking, what that does is it eliminates the center fire part that was supposed to be in there to where it would now allow a rim fire cartridge. So that was a little bit of an unintended thing there that we may need to fix. Um, I know that's a little bit confusing, especially when I when I lost myself there, but subsection 5 dealt with handguns, and it used to say a person may hunt big game mammals with a handgun if the handgun uses a center fire cartridge, has a barrel length of 4 inches or more, 
and then it went on to describe the cartridge length. A cartridge of caliber 22 or larger with an overall loaded length of two inches or more, or uses a cartridge of caliber 24 or larger with a case of length no less than the length of the case of a cartridge for a Remington Magnum of caliber 44. <coughs> My whole career I've thought that definition was very wordy and hard to understand. Um, I finally had to sit down one day and measure every handgun round I could find to figure out for my own brain what was, what was legal and what wasn't. There were some thoughts from the board at the last workshop that uh, we may want to reduce that um, handgun cartridge limit. Specifically, uh, there was some discussion about mountain lions, especially when a mountain lion is treed. Um, in the past, people have killed a mountain lion in the tree with a 40 caliber or, or a 9 millimeter, one of the semi-automatic handgun rounds. Uh, which wouldn't be legal under this prior definition. So there was some appetite from some of the county boards and some of the folks on, on the state commission here to get rid of that prohibition and allow a 9 millimeter, a 40, or a 45 ACP. Um, specifically, I think folks were talking about mountain lions, but, um, but the motion was made at the, prior, at the last workshop to bring that down to just say caliber 22 or larger um, for any big game mammal. There was some discussion where people were a little bit concerned about, uh, you know, maybe somebody trying to hunt deer or elk with a 9 millimeter. Clearly, that's a little pipsqueak round and, and not adequate for shooting a deer or an elk with. But, uh, um, but the board's thought was that doesn't provide an advantage like a 50 caliber discussion would. It's act, it would actually be a disadvantage to try to go after a, a big game mammal with a, with a semi-automatic handgun. So. I'm rambling a little bit, but effectively what this would do as the, as the board moved at the last meeting was to eliminate all that description of cartridge length for minimum handgun rounds and just say it's a legal handgun round if it's caliber 22 or larger and has a barrel length of four inches or more. Practically speaking, that would allow, uh, you know, as long as it had a four inch barrel, that would allow nine millimeters, 40s, 45 ACPs, the kind of stuff that, that was um, prohibited before. Turning the page, Section 5A deals with some of the stuff we looked at the videos about with um, electronic rifles or smart rifles as they're called. Um, this is primarily a company called Tracking Point Rifles that uh, builds that computer tracking rifle that gets laser lock on the target and then you depress the trigger and when the crosshairs get back up to the laser lock then the rifle fires itself and calculates for all the uh, factors and they guarantee half inch accuracy at, at 1800 yards with a, with a uh, target that moves up to 30 miles an hour. That's that part. When we initially wrote it, we said uh, something to the effect of, of uh, electronic controlled trigger, um, and, and uh, it was suggested at the Yarrington meeting that we change that to say, any firearm that is equipped with any sighting system using a computer or electronically controlled firing mechanism. I think that's more accurate technically um, when it's talking about a firing mechanism rather than an electronic trigger, and we discussed that uh, that way we wouldn't accidentally eliminate something that could be used by a disabled hunter as far as a, a trigger that, uh, a mechanism that, that pushes the trigger. So that's 5A section that talks about the electronic rifles. Section 5B basically says it's unlawful to hunt a big game mammal with a rifle if the rifle uses a center fire cartridge smaller than caliber 22 or larger than caliber 50 or a center fire cartridge with a case length of more than three inches. So there are some significant changes in there that that uh, don't look like much of a change, but practically speaking, they're a pretty big change. The way this was first drafted uh, spoke to um, larger than caliber 46 or center fire cartridge with an overall loaded length more than 3.8. It was pointed out that, that uh, there are a lot of variations in how a person hand loads their rounds, so it would be more practical to look at case length. Went to case length of three inches. Um, you can certainly go through the PowerPoint again uh, at the next meeting if you want, but. The case length of three inches would still allow pretty much any uh, popular big game round today on up to 300 Ultra Mag, 3378, 338 Lapua, um, you know, 340 Weatherby, basically the biggest of what's considered to be big game rounds. It would still allow them, but prohibit the 50 BMG and the 416 Barrett. Um, there are a couple others that uh, were pointed out in some letters from the NRA about uh, a 505 Jeffrey and a 470 Nitro Express and a couple others that I've never never seen in the field, never had my hands on one. Um, the other portion being the, the uh, larger than caliber 50. That little wording change, larger than caliber 50, would allow 50 calibers, just nothing bigger than 50. And when I say 50 caliber, I'm talking about 
the technical definition of the word caliber, the diameter of the bullet. It allows up to 50, but not over, the way this is written. Where that becomes important is for, there are some little short stubby rounds that are 50 caliber, like a 50 Beowulf. I know there was a member of the Churchill board who's building a 50 Beowulf for a disabled, a disabled child, and, and uh, by this, de this definition, that fits. Basically saying that uh, it can be up to caliber 50, as long as it's got a case length of, of uh, no more than three inches. I rambled there a bit. Like I said, we could talk about all the public input, letters we received, all that sort of stuff, but um, that's the, the uh, breakdown of how the language came back from LCB. I appreciate that. I had a, a letter come in late, I think, last night talking about a 500 s and W. I believe the case length is super short, so that would is something that would be allowed, just to clarify. Yep, 500 um, s and W would be good because it's got a case length less than three inches, and it's not over caliber 50. Well, I have the benefit of Commissioner Bliss. I think 5A took care of a lot of the concerns we had with uh, the potential for disabled hunters in the field. Does that change, Commissioner Bliss, or are you still of that opinion based on your experience? I, I believe it, it's good. Okay. All right, at this point what I'm going to do is I'm not going to open it up to a lot of commission discussion. I want to get public comment in. We're running tight on time here. So um, being mindful of people's time, I'm going to open it up to public comment uh, on item 23. Just in case someone didn't hear me, I don't intend to take any action on this today. I just wanted to clarify where we were with it. Um, I intend to bring it back for the August meeting, so at least we can finish our discussion on it. I don't want to rush it today, but I know there's some folks here that would like to, to provide comment. So being mindful that we're up against the time limit, um, please provide some succinct comments with the realization that you're going to be able to provide another round of comments. With that, I'll open up item 23 uh, to public comment in Las Vegas, and then we'll go to Reno and Elko. Las Vegas. Uh, Chairman Drew, as Julius Fortuna uh, with Nevada Firearms Coalition, will I have six minutes? You will. Um, if you can be more brief, I would appreciate it. But if you need the full six minutes, go ahead. Again, you'll have Thank another you. opportunity in August. Thank you. So I represent Nevada Firearms Coalition, which is a chapter of the NRA representing 35,000 firearms owners and thousands of sportsmen and women in Nevada. I've submitted letters from the Nevada Firearms Coalition, the NRA, and the 50 Caliber Institute in opposition to this proposed caliber ban, so please uh, make sure they're official record. Um, our opposition was supported recently with our social media site, which lit up and sub sub absolutely um, thousands of likes for this opposition. The Nevada State Legislature granted the Commission the authority to promulgate regulations under NRS 501.105. The Commission shall establish policies and adapt regulations necessary to prevent protection, management, restoration of wildlife and its habitat. Within the statutory authority, there are three primary reasons to enact regulations in Nevada. First, the proposed regulation must be based on specific documented data that justifies the new regulation will improve wildlife and habitat. Second, must be based on scientifically documented data to justify the new regulation will prevent negative effect on wildlife and its habitat. And third, must be based on documented facts that justify the new regulation protects the public health and safety. We strongly object to the, op to the proposed regulations banning these uh, centerfire rifles. All of these banned cartridges are safely being used in hunting big game around the world, such as the 500 Nitro Express, the 50 BMG 577 Nitro Express, and the 505 Gibbs. The information presented to date to justify this regulation does not meet any of the three criteria presented above. The ban's rational seems to be instead focused on hunters' individual morality and, th and theoretically unsportsmanlike conduct that is being, not being conducted um, with other calibers. The justification is simply not there and does not provide documented cases regarding the dangerous or criminal acts for these affected calibers. The rationale that I have heard is four part. Hunters with this caliber are taking too long of shots at big game. Again, morality, bad choices on shots, all can be done with a 30 out six as well. The top reason though for the ban is the wanton waste issue. 50 cows will literally blow up big game animals into bits, leaving unacceptable amounts of usable meat. Hey, at first it sounds logical, in the knowledge, uh, but if the knowledge is based on the silver screen, that's about it. The problem is that the rationale of the fo is the following concerns. Wanton waste is already regulated by Nevada statute. Let's enforce, uh, so let's enforce existing laws on this. Hey, it's an important thing. And I heard that Endow has some concerns with the, the law not being defensible. If that's the case, let's please fix that law. Terminal performance laws are number two, and the physics just prove this rationale is totally false. 
The 50 BMG shoots a 570 to 700 grain projectile at slower than 308 30-06 30 velocities, 2,500 to 2,700 feet per second muzzle velocity. The 50 cal's current list of Nevada legal hunting bullets are very super thick, bonded cord, jacketed bullets, which expand slowly but very effectively, and so almost from any angle. Bottom line is slow impact velocity is under 2,200 feet per second, and a thick bonded core bullet means less wanton waste than, let's say, a 30 caliber magnum with a thin jacketed 150 grain bullet at 3,400 feet per second. Number three is, according to the language in the proposal, it's just too big a military caliber. And the question is, by whose standards is that? The public safety concern is what I thought was the primary, but it's also not accurate. There have been zero past felonious acts with this caliber in Nevada or in any state. And I can provide facts presented to two Senate subcommittee hearings by the 50 Caliber Institute, which you guys have information sent to you. So now we get to the potential dangerous reason for this ban, which is an anti-Second anti Amendment rhetoric. It's disconcerting to me that no one in our Las Vegas cab meeting this past week could determine where this proposed, how this proposed regulation came through the full legislature legal language ready to become law first time the team has seen that in years. So my question is who's driving this? No one seems to know where, why this bill is here in the first place. Is it political incorrectness? Is it social science gone amiss? Or is it cynical in nature? I fully believe that the vast majority of Endow and its commissions does not have an anti-Second Amendment agenda, especially knowing who keeps the lights on. But when we abandon clear statutory guidelines that promote uh, guidelines and promote bans on calibers with a he said, she said, your critical consumptive users trust slides down a slippery slope of, oh boy, here comes some more anti-gun emotional Cajun. So at this point, the 50 is steeped in military history. We should never forget that the most popular hunting caliber ever made is a 30 6 also steeped in military history. Same with the 308, 223, 556, and the 338, which I heard just mentioned, the 338 Lapua, the current long range champion. All of this hyperbole. Mr. Cortina, is I know you, I'm going to interrupt you. I know you have six minutes, but we're getting tight on time. I think this is information we received via email. Are you reading the, course, the written correspondence? You provide. No, Chairman, I'm not. It's, there's there's a, quite a bit different here. But I, I'll wrap it up. You've got a minute left. So the hunters, our numbers are declining in Nevada while the number of hunting regulations increases each year. It doesn't take another sportsman-funded scientific study to realize that we don't need more, more rules to discourage participation in a critical conservation hunting event. Um, this ban is not enacted for the betterment of wildlife or habitat or for public safety, but upon illogical and subjective re restrictions that are not really under the authority granted to the state legislature. And the bottom line is that Nevada Firearm Coalition, the NRA, the 50 Caliber Institute oppose and the proposed rule and respectfully recommend that it be eliminated for lack of science and importantly um, for not aligning with NRS 501-105. Thank you. Additional public comment, Las Vegas, item 23. No, <clears throat> no public comment, Las Vegas. Okay, how about Reno? No comment in Reno. Thank you, Chairman. And Elko, public comment or county advisory board inputs? Come on up and line up so we can get this going because we're getting tight. Robert Pagoda for the record. Uh, Chairman Drew and Commissioners. Um, I'm standing in again for uh, Shannon Scott who is representing herself. Um, uh, the cal uh, I'll just read this. The caliber restriction, while maybe mostly pointed at law enforcement or officer safety is the first step in banning these and a great many other calibers including but not list, limited to and I have a, a list of about 45 handguns I could read some off 50 Alaskan if you've uh, got it in writing or we've already seen it no you haven't but okay. I'll, I'll I won't I won't read it or submit it to us and we'll put it on the exhibit file, okay please. Um, to say that only a few rifle calibers will be effective is uh, simply false. The ban would not make it impossible for a global hunter a global hunter to use exceedingly precise and high-end rifles like Holland and Hollands and others that are typically uh, one large caliber and two in nearly all cases a single shot. These 
are not repeating rifles. Further, this caliber issue appears to be thinly veiled guys for anti-hunters and anti-gun advocates to follow up with the state legislature by arguing that since the state wildlife commission has banned these calibers, then they serve no hunting or sporting purposes, and therefore the general public does not need to have them, which is an argument these anti-sportsmen groups have been using across the U.S. In fact, the Second Amendment says nothing about bearing arms for hunting purposes, yet in some jurisdiction this argument has been effective and we absolutely cannot have it happen here. Thank you for hearing my uh, comments. If you have that written, please submit it to us so we can put it on our file. Next comment. For the record, uh, Paul Dixon, the, at our cab um, on the item about handgun and handgun caliber, there was a lot of concern about 22 or larger caliber and a four inch barrel and for shooting big game animals. And I, and I really have a problem. If we, if we have this, if we have this NAC open and we're looking at it, that should be fixed because we we set, when you're bow hunting, you have to have a six inch barrel and a certain caliber. And now we're in this regulation saying something different. And I'm, I'm a little concerned that you got to carry a larger caliber gun bow hunting than you do have to go shoot big game if you want to just go out and shoot big game. And so I would ask that we look at that as a commission when we go into that, just because to me, you, uh, there's a difference. And maybe I'm mistaken, but there's a difference there. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment, Elko. Joel coming up. Rex, get right behind him. For the record, Joel Blakesley speaking as a member of the general public right now. Um, I'm against this. I heard earlier in the license consolidation presentation about the complexity of regulations and how that uh, tends to discourage participation by hunters and whatnot. This is a complexity of regulation thing. You're going about it the exact wrong way with the caliber. You take a scope off of a 50 caliber and it's just a 30-30. If you're concerned about long range shooting, it has nothing to do with the caliber. You better talk about scopes. Because an iron sight, a long range shot is 300 yards, no matter whether it's a 50 caliber or a 30 out six. <coughs> if you're concerned about meat damage, a 243 through the hams will do way more meat damage than a 50 caliber through the ribs. The Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife, I'll, I'll change hats and say that they're opposed to this regulation. And no one's ever been able to show me that there's ever been a problem with hunting. So why are we doing this? This is a loser all the way around. Thank you. Next public comment. Rex, anyone else come on up because we're going quick. Rex Flowers speaking for myself. Um, I want to speak to the fact that all we have for evidence is anecdotal. We've heard these weapons have been used on a few occasions. And therefore, we're, we're questioning about ethics and, and uh, fair chase. And I sit on the TAC committee with uh, uh, Commissioners uh, Johnston, Morai, and Valentine. And we just had an ethics issue dealing with um, people riding on other people's bonus points to get drawn for get big game tags. And we found in that, you know, our findings were that less than one half of one percent of these people are doing such. And we took uh, a position to take no action and create a regulation because the problem was so minuscule. And it, while it does have to do with ethics, those people have to live with their ethics. And I would hope you would look at this the same way. If you have two or three people, let it take care of itself. It will eventually. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, Jim Cooney, Elko Cab. Uh, we go on record in opposition to this particular regulation. Uh, we feel there's enough regulations as there is right already. Um, and as we talk about morals and or ethics, uh, no matter what regulations you come up with, you, you won't be able to regulate those two things. So I'd urge your support to uh, do away with this particular regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment. For the record, Henry Krinka speaking for the Nevada Outfitters and Guides Association. I just would like to be on record 
as opposing any regulation on calibers. Okay. Anyone else? All right, with that, I'm going to bring it back to the board, and I normally don't do this, but I'm going to close the item without taking comment. Again, this will be back up in August, so we do have an opportunity to present it. I just wanted to give everyone a chance who is here to say their piece. Um, so we'll close item 23 without action. We'll open item 28, future commission meetings and commission committee assignments. Secretary Tony Wasley and Chairman Drew for possible action. The next commission meeting is scheduled for August 12 and 13, 2016 in Reno with time allocated for a commission and county advisory board to manage wildlife workshop. The commission will review and discuss potential agenda items for that meeting. The commission may change the time and meeting location at this time. The chairman may designate or adjust committee assignments as necessary at this meeting. Um, again, there's going to be no changes to committee assignments at this time. I don't anticipate any change on time or meeting location, um, although I don't know that the location is set yet. In terms of items, uh, we do have uh, Carson City BLM Wild Horse Plan came up, policies 10 and 11, uh, NACs on appeals and petitions, and the policy on wildlife contests. Committees, public lands uh, probably needs to meet, go over what we've been assigned to review for policies. Um, and Dave, I believe your committee was going to have a meeting. We'd like to have a meeting in conjunction with the commission meeting in August. Any others? <clears throat> Tech. Tech. Anything I'm missing? Okay. That's all I had, Director Wesley. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chairman Drew. Uh, as you indicated, uh, the date's August 12th and 13th. That meeting will be in Reno. We did recently learn that the venue that we've used uh, so frequently in the past, the Truckee Meadows Community College, uh, will be unavailable as they're holding their graduation ceremony for their uh, paramedics. So. We will uh, diligently seek an appropriate alternate location and make that location known as soon as it's uh, known to us and secure. I do have a few additional agenda items uh, that came out of discussion between yesterday and today. Uh, for that agenda, uh, update of the uh, license simplification effort along with an update regarding the input that was received through the July stakeholder meetings. You indicated the uh, wildlife uh, killing contest policy will come before the full commission. Uh, one other order of business for that meeting is the election of the chair and vice chair. And I know that uh, recent history that has occurred at the beginning of that meeting. However, uh, historically, that frequently occurred at the conclusion of that August meeting. And so I would prefer to. To, uh, I guess the commission is how they wanted to follow that. Uh, I know there's been quite a bit of discussion uh, amongst yourselves uh, relative to that, so I'll, I'll let you have that discussion. Um, a couple other items, as you mentioned, uh, the uh, electronic trigger caliber restriction that we just spoke about briefly will be on that agenda. Um, regulation pertaining to appeals, trail cameras, oak drains. <coughs> relative to AIS concerns, uh, petition uh, regulation, uh, possibility, well, however, it's unlikely that we'll see the uh, regulation relative to game retrieval that we were seeking <coughs> to assist uh, handicapped individuals with uh, assistance and game retrieval. There's a possibility we'll get that language back, uh, but it's probably unlikely. Uh, we'll also hopefully see a bonus point transfer regulation that will allow for a seamless transfer of bonus points between residents and non-residents. Um, basically, the idea is to do away with the application of the form that currently transfers that, and that would be seamless in both directions. And then we also have a uh, lower Truckee River uh, tackle restriction regulation that may be uh, coming forward to uh, afford some of the uh, large by the peak strain, cutthroat trout spawning in the river, some protection well well down river. A uh, couple CRs, uh, we talked about the uh, overlap and discrepancies between the uh, Utah and Nevada elk seasons, and we'll be looking at proposing an amendment so that, although I don't believe we'll be able to make that uh, overlap occur throughout both, but we can possibly uh, address some of that discrepancy between those two seasons and then also uh, an item I had that came up today was the adjustment of the heritage turkey tag legal shooting hours 
through amendment as well. And that concludes my list of items. Okay. Any commission discussion on this? I'm not looking for a motion, but are you pumpkin me on the election? I don't. I actually think the policy is silent on that. No, I, I'm not pumpkin you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, historically, like I say, recently that that chairmanship has been uh, the elections has occurred at the beginning of the meeting, but prior to the last half dozen years or so, it was something that occurred at the conclusion of that meeting. And I know there's several of these um, regulations, several of these issues where uh, you have provided leadership as chairman. Sometimes it's difficult to transition. Uh, and I just wanted to put that out there as an option. Uh, I don't think there's there's anything that uh, requires that election of a new chair and vice chair to occur at the beginning of that meeting. It can occur at the conclusion of that meeting if it's the commission's desire. Okay. I'll review a, a policy one on there. It does put the new chair at a little bit of a disadvantage having not been the person to develop the agenda. Um, so I guess if it shakes out that way, we could do it. But I wanted to get the flavor of this board. Is there a concern one way or the other, so long as there's not something in policy one on whether or a preference, whether we do it at the beginning or at the end of the meeting? Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that we do it at the end of the meeting. Okay. I agree. I agree. It's hard for the chairman and chairman to have it. Well, hopefully we'll have two new appointments. I know the last couple times we've gone a couple meetings without getting those. Um, I have asked that that process be expedited. Um, so <clears throat> it will be awkward not having you guys there, but uh, so is life. So with that, um, this is a, a possible action, so I'll open it up. Item 28, any public input on item 28, future commission meetings in Las Vegas? Yes, Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, after Director Wasley said that the uh, community college wasn't gonna be available because of a uh, graduation, what I'm hearing is it's highly unlikely that it will be video conference. Is that something that probably is the case? Or is it, do you have options of other locations? Thank you. Okay. Any other comment, Vegas? No, Chairman, thank you. Reno? No comment in Reno. Elko? Before we close the item, I would address the video conferencing um, it's going to be dependent on whether or not we can find a site that can host enough people and whether that talks to the venues in Elko and Las Vegas. We'll certainly do what we can to find something that um, provides video conferencing capabilities. Okay. The only other thing I would say before I close that item is I would encourage the county advisory boards and maybe even more than just the chairman of your advisory boards to attend. Again, if you have uh, items that you'd like me to incorporate into the agenda, so that we can have a discussion and a, a productive workshop. Please get those to me, and sooner the better on that, so we can set the agenda. Anything else on item 28? Seeing none, we'll close item 28. Go to item 29, public comment period. Persons wishing to speak or request to complete a speaker's card and present it to the recording <coughs> secretary. Public comment will be limited to three minutes. No action can be taken by the commission at this time. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Before we open this, I'm going to start in the remote locations uh, because our time is getting short. I have had requests from several commissioners to speak, uh, given the fact that it's Commissioner Morai and Commissioners Bliss last meeting. Uh, so we'll hold that until the end to let all of our public provide comment first. So uh, public comment, item 29 in Las Vegas. No comment in Las Vegas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Public comment under item 29 in Reno. On the record, Harry Ward, I'm going to yield, but I'll just discuss this with the department about lifetime fishing and hunting licenses, but I'm going to yield because we're on a tight schedule. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Go ahead. Next comment, hey. Reno. Hi, Karen Taylor, Washoe County resident. I wanted to thank Commissioner Bliss for his service to wildlife and to the state and uh, Commissioner Morai, I, I'm going to really miss you. I know we didn't agree on very much, but I really appreciate everything that you did and everything that you uh, spoke to me about last September in Las Vegas. You might not remember, but I remember vividly. Thank you very much. Next comment, Reno. No more comment in Reno. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. 
Appreciate the, the staff at the two remote locations for manning the lines and keeping them open. All right, public comment item 29 in Elko. Mr. Blakesley, come on up. I know you can't respond to this. Joe Blakesley for the record, Nevada Trappers Association. I'm assuming that you're going to send an explanation to the nine cabs about the bobcat season um, and why you voted against it. I'd like to respectfully request that the Nevada Trappers Association be copied with that explanation if that's possible. I need to know what the perceptions are so that I can address them in the future. Thank you. Additional public comment? Seeing none. Who amongst the commission would like to start? Commissioner McNinch. I will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't hold up real well with these things, so I'm going to try to get it out and get taken care of. But uh, um, I didn't realize that Dag Newton was out of here as well. So uh, um, I'm going to be very, very brief. And I just want to say that to all three of you, um, we've connected on a personal level in different ways. And uh, I very much value your friendships and uh, your input and the time we spent together. And uh, you guys mean a lot to me. And it's been good working again. Hope to see you in the future. Commissioner Young, I think you already spoke, but just yeah. in case. Well, one, uh, Dave, we are we talk. Good luck with the transportation. I can handle Georgia side. If you need any help, let me know. Uh, <laughs> Pete and Chad, I already spoke. You know how I feel about you guys. I'm going to miss you a lot. A lot. Commissioner Johnston? Yeah, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I also don't want to say anything. But. Uh, Serving on this commission can be very, very difficult at times. It also means weekends away from your family, but uh, one of the things that makes it uh, much more enjoyable and easier was the opportunity to see new friends. And uh, I always uh, enjoyed the time we got to spend together outside of the meetings, um, talking about things other than what we deal with in this room. And uh, it's been a real honor and pleasure uh, to serve with you. Pete and Chad, and despite the criticisms that are lobbed against this, this commission at times and comments about uh, those of us from the rural areas of Nevada, uh, Commissioners Moore and Bliss are two of the finest people uh, I've ever met, two of the finest people I've ever, ever had the opportunity to work with, and uh, their integrity and their passion for Nevada and wildlife is, is beyond question. And uh, I'm going to miss. Both of you, but uh, I'll be seen during the chucker season, so I'll be up in Tuscarora sometime after the middle of October. So I wish you all the best of luck and everything. Welcome back. Commissioner Valentine, I'll go to you next. Okay, thanks. Uh, not a firm believer in goodbyes. Um, I consider both these gentlemen next to me friends and, and all this world. You've uh, been exemplary in, in everything you do, in touch and, and sensitivities. Uh, you've been a lot to me since the short time I've known you being here. Chad, yeah, we've shared some great experiences. One I'll never forget, and I hope to share many more with you. So, not goodbye. Commissioner Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's not a lot more that can be said, but I, I do want you guys both to know that good friends, and I have the utmost respect for each of you, and I know we share a lot of common values, and uh, I'm sure we'll see each other again. I know we will, but it's tough. We'll miss you, and I'll have to find somebody else to drive around Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, scary thought. Um, I'm going to go by seniority here and give Pete the last word. I'm actually going to pull chair's privilege, but Commissioner Bliss, if you'd like to address the, the commission, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Drew. Um, it's been an honor um, to uh, sit on this commission um, with these fine men, and, and uh, we all share, everyone in here shares a passion um, for our wildlife and um, not just 
the members of the commission, but uh, the department staff, all of their employees. Um, I have the utmost respect for all of them. I, uh, I've been, even though I sat on the commission for three year term, the short term, been around this stuff for about 20 years and uh, doesn't seem like that, but I remember standing at that podium shaking in my boots, scared plumb to death of all these guys. They're meaner than hell, I thought. And uh, I, uh, I just, <clears throat> I've seen a transition in the department and I've never seen it better than it is right now. The, um, we've had some great commissions in the past, some not so great. Um, and, and in my opinion, I hope you guys don't take this wrong, in, in the past I've seen some errors in the department in, in different uh, ways. But they're not there now. If they are, they're very small. And my hat's off to uh, um, Tony and Jack and all of your staff um, for turning the department into what it is today. Um, I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, I look at it as a big family now um, between the commission, the department, the cabs, most of the public. Uh, it's, I see good things happening and the future of Nevada's wildlife is in great hands. Um, me deciding not to do a second term is hard. We, we sit up here and we make some very, very difficult decisions. Um, but nothing was, no decision that I've ever made on this commission was harder than decision I made to step off of it. And it's mainly because of the people here in this room. I have uh, full confidence in the governor to appoint someone in my position that will do better than I, I than I have done. I'm sure of it. And uh, the conference is about to end. Well, I guess I'll wrap. That up. <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to Tony saying I'm long-winded, um, <laughs> but. But I feel the same about everyone on this commission, and I'm going to miss miss them all. And and uh, yeah, Brad and Grant, you are going to have to put your taxi cab hats away because you won't need to drive Pete and I around anymore. But but uh, thank all of you. I've learned something from each and every one of you, and and I hope to see you guys all uh, in the future. I think I'm going to start. Maybe. All the time you need. You I'm got gonna, a short drive. Really. <laughs> I'm going to say something about this guy. If, uh, if I was in a dark alley, okay, I'd want that guy standing next to me. <laughs> if I was uh, in Syria, Tracking down ISIS. I'd want him walking with me. If I was on the Wildlife Damage Management Committee, <laughs> I'd want him sitting next to me. <laughs> but uh, through since he's been a commissioner, we I think most of you know that we've traveled together. Uh, from Eureka to Las Vegas to the Vegas meetings. And during, during that time, I've gotten to know him pretty well. And he's become a real good friend of mine. And he told me that the, one of the reasons that he was thinking about getting off the commission is so that he could take that time and spend with family. And so, during this, this whole time also, I've gotten a chance to meet his family and actually know him. And, oops, now I know that came out there. And anyway, uh, um, I have a little story here and I don't want to take up too much time, but 
uh, on one of those trips, we met at his house in Eureka, and it was storming. There was about six inches of snow on the ground, and it was predicted to be storming when we got back. And I told Chad, uh, hey, I got new wiper blades behind the seat of the truck, but I didn't get time to put them on. So my wiper blades are in terrible shape. And so he never said too much. But when we got back, the, the night after the meeting, Rosie had changed the wiper blades and the truck was parked inside so that I'd have fresh wiper blades and a nice clean windshield when I headed for home. Another, another trip, we got home and Chad's kids tried giving me a goat. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you guys that, you know, that was the, that's the type of relationship that we've developed and I'm, I'm uh, honored to have served on this commission with you. Now for, for myself, I, I first of all like to, to start by uh, thanking Governor Sandoval for providing me this opportunity. And I truly consider it a rewarding opportunity to serve on this commission. And uh, it's the best commission. His appointees are the best commissioners that I ever sat with. And I've been on the commission long enough to where it wasn't always like that. And so I'd like to commend him and his advisors for putting 